Welcome to Positive Talk Radio. Our goal is simple, to explore evolving ideas one conversation at a time. So stay with us as right now we present. And welcome to Positive Talk Radio. It's a Thursday afternoon. And this is a really is a kind of a a Western Hemisphere show today. Um, Our guest and I'll introduce you. Well, you can see who it is right there. It's it's Yogi Aaron and uh, uh, Kayatana Sands and uh, something or other is our co-host today. How do you pronounce your last name? Unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> San Segundo. I'm sorry? San Segundo. Okay. Kayatana yeah. is with us. <laughs> <laughs> that's and uh she's co-hosting today and and uh i gotta tell you um the gentleman that we have on is really is world renowned he is a he's a yogi master uh he he works with yoga he does some incredible things with uh with healing he's got his own center in costa rica and uh he's with us for the entire hour we're very excited to have him. Yogi Aaron is with us. Yogi, how are you? I'm doing really great. Thanks so much, Kevin, for asking. It's been now, I... a whirlwind of a day, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. And I got to ask you, is it is it Mr. Yogi? Is it is it just Yogi? Is it Mr. Aaron, the Yogi? How, how best to address you? I kind of like Mr. Yogi. That is cool. Um, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, So Yogi is more of a title, but a lot of my uh, friends call me Yogi as like a nickname, um, especially living in Costa Rica. Uh, So I go by, typically I like to be introduced as Yogi Aaron, uh, but you know, some of my students just call me Yogi or Yogi Aaron. So whatever you, whatever is easiest for you. Just don't call me Boo Boo. <laughs> hey, hey, Boo Boo. <laughs> A question for you, um, for those who don't know, because uh, and they may, if, if, when you actually meet a yogi, you're probably too intimidated to ask this question. It's like, so what does yogi mean? Oh, yogi is someone who practices yoga. That's pretty much about it. Oh, but but you're really good at it. <laughs> <I would. laughs> so, it, yeah, it's just kind of like a title, if you will. It's it's just, you know, so people know right away, like who I am uh, and what I do. So there's there's um, some sense of familiarity uh, with me. Is well, I got to tell you. Is it yogi for sorry? Is it yogi for men? Yogini for women? Or it's all the way around? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like an uh, you know how women sometimes can be called actresses, and now more and more you're hearing actor. I think it's appropriate to call a woman, you know, a yogi or yogini. So sometimes when I come into a room and I'm teaching, I'll say good morning, yogis and yoginis. <laughs> <laughs> So, I've never heard the term yogini before. That's that's, yes. that's new for me. Yeah. Actually, I mean, this is a little off topic, but um, in India, there's a very famous, famous, famous spot, um, especially to those who practice Tantra, called Kajuraho. And uh, Kajuraho is this incredible uh, vortex of energy, this, this space where they unearthed all of these ancient uh, temples, temples that have been around for 1,500 years, some as much as 2,000 years. And at that space, uh, there's a temple of the 64 yoginis. And it's these primordial mothers that are sitting in constant meditation and watching over the galaxy. So yogini is a very sacred... Uh, connotation or den- denotion is that the right word to domination the yoga. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. something i don't know, I don't know. If, if, if i was an english professor i wouldn't be doing this because english <laughs> like kaitana english is my second language so. yeah i i completely hear that yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so now this the site in india again in, yes. in case I, I can add it to my bucket list what's it called again 
Kajaraho. Um, I believe it's spelled K-A-J-U-R-A-H-O. It's one of the most incredible places in the world to go to, especially in India. And it doesn't get a lot of press. Uh, you kind of have to be a little bit in the know to know to go there. So it's it's a beautiful, sacred space. Well, add that to the list, uh, Kayatana. Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> now, I know you've been studying quite a little bit, young lady. Do you have a question for Yogi? Yeah. It, so I have a question for you. Um, your, your passion lies in guiding people towards living their best pain-free life. Could you share some practical tips or daily practices that individuals can incorporate into their routines to proactively manage and alleviate pain in various aspects of their life? That's a loaded question. It's really. So, I, um, uh, so there, there is a loaded question. I mean, tips in how to live your best pain-free life. So my big shtick is, first of all, first and foremost, to stop stretching. And I have been practicing yoga for pretty much since I was 18 years old. And when I was um, 18, my body was really stiff. And so I turned to yoga to stretch. And it, my yoga practice back then was really about stretching. There was no spirituality uh, involved in it. But I started stretching and very quickly I hurt myself, you know, just in life moving around. I, I tweaked my back and my back seized up. And I thought to myself, good God, I'm 18 years old and um, I'm, I feel like I'm 100 right now. And but the solution was to stretch more. Nobody told me anything different. So I just started stretching more and more. And that kind of led me 25 years later after teaching and having a very strong stretching practice into the emergency room of a hospital where a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon told me I was going to need a spinal fusion in my lower back. And that really kind of stopped me in my tracks because I was kind of like, I'm a yoga teacher. I should be this, you know, beacon of health and longevity and strength and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it really forced me to kind of take a moment of reevaluating everything I thought I knew. And what I ended up doing was going back to the drawing board. And in doing so, I, I quickly, quickly became aware of the fact that stretching actually debilitates you and makes you weaker. So that made me kind of flip the script um, or drive my, my purpose and intention in flipping the script in the yoga world because so much in the yoga world, especially, but in other modalities as well, is like stretching is seen as the be all and end all. Um, and if you can't, you know, take your foot behind your head, then you've got, you know, tightness and you've got to get rid of it. And it's just insane. Some of the things that people are saying in the yoga world. So I've made it my mission to flip the script. So in terms of like daily activities, stop stretching. <laughs> the second part is to start activating. And that's what my passion is about is, is helping people to, activate the muscles of their body. Uh, so many of us are moving through life. When I say moving through life, I don't mean exercise. I mean, going, you know, going grocery shopping and, you know, carrying those groceries back in from your car to uh, your kitchen and, and the, all the bending over that you have to do to put things away. And so we're constantly moving around in life and how many people that are listening are moving through their life and then all of a sudden they tweak their lower back because they sneeze the wrong way or you know they leaned over the counter to pick pick up something or whatever they're doing i remember one time i tweaked my upper back and into my neck by reaching in the shower for the shampoo bottle that was you know 6 inches above my head and my whole neck just completely tightened up so 
what my goal is, is to give people a stronger uh, system of, of muscles, if you want to call it that. And it, it does not involve any kind of weightlifting or squats or exercising. It does involve just some simple muscle activation practices to build this connection, this neurological connection between the brain and the muscles so that the muscles can start doing their job properly. And so when I reach for that shampoo bottle, that very heavy shampoo bottle, and I, my whole neck seized up, my whole upper back seized up, that the muscles that were moving my arm were not working properly. And so when the muscles don't work properly in our body, what does the body do as a response? What does our, our neurological system do as a response? It tightens up. Uh, so that tightness is a response to instability. It's a response to muscles not doing their job properly. So if we get the muscles working properly, then we have a stronger uh, system and we won't have to deal with all of those aches and pains all the time. So a big part of it is just taking, you know, people ask me like, well, how much do I have to do? Do eight minutes a day, set the timer <laughs> on your phone. You know, if you're, if you're a yogi or a yogini on the go in life and uh, yogi go, go and set it for eight minutes and just like seriously and just do eight minutes a day that's all it takes um i've been kind of working throughout my day and i've been very busy and focused but i stopped everything i set my timer eight minutes and i went and did some of my own muscle activation practices and like i feel more stable you know any kind of aches and pains are gone uh because i'm sitting a lot today working on my computer and you just feel completely recharged and energized uh, when your body is working properly. And so when we're when our body is strong, we're less susceptible to pain. And when our muscles are working, we're no longer afflicted by pain. And so pain is like one of the biggest detractors in our lives. Like when we're in pain, all of our mental energy is going to that one question, how can I get out of pain? And that's not where your mental energy should be going. Your mental energy should be going to asking the question, how can I fulfill life's purpose? Not like, how can I get out of pain? So that's that's also a big part of why I do what I do, because I, I really believe like there would be more happy people if people weren't so much in pain. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, Yogi, for, first of all, I want to um, acknowledge Kayla May. She's a friend of the show. Oh, Very beautiful you. souls you have on today. Happy holidays to you all. And um, and I love you too, kid. Um, she has worked with us in the past. She's a, she's a wonderful soul, wonderful human being. And she, she is psychic herself. So she knows if you are who you say you are. And when she says that, that means that she believes in who you are, which is which is awesome. And Kayla May, while you're still here, I want you to be able to go to the Yogi Club backslash P or forward slash one or the other to PTR. And there's some inter in interesting information online that you can pick up about what Yogi does and some and some things that he is working on. So uh, that's the Yogi Club forward slash ptr and uh and so uh, do that and that okay uh i he's she's oh okay and yogi's gonna set it up after the show so don't go there yet uh, he'll, <laughs> he'll set it up in a little while um but uh, i just wanted to in case she has to go i wanted to make sure that she she had the opportunity to do that um and by the way and the other thing is uh, Kayla recently had a baby. Uh, well, I've been a year now. I don't think she can put her <laughs> foot behind her head. Kaitana, can you put your, can you take your foot and put it behind your head? I know. I mean, when I, I feel intimidated when I go to yoga to, you know, classes and I see people doing that, and I feel like I'm failing, you know, it's so much stress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, oh. but I, 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 one day. <laughs> oh, her, how time flies. Her child is almost two now. So uh, anyway, so Kayla May, 
Uh, let's see. And uh, no, I, I no, she can't either. So how many people in the world? And isn't that isn't that just kind of something naturally you can do if you're skinny, if you're flexible, you can do that. But most people isn't isn't aren't you risking <laughs> i'd kill my hamstring if i tried to do that <laughs> i it's there first of all most of the people that can put their foot behind their head uh there's kind of two categories of people there's one kind of person where they have abnormal hip structures um one of my dearest friends has those kind of uh, abnormal hip structures. And I don't quite know how to biomechanically explain it other than to use the word abnormal. So I don't say that in a negative way. It's just the way that their hips are structured and into the ball and socket. It's a little different than the normal people like you and me. <laughs> but yeah. what happens is a lot of those people end up having increased range of motion, AKA flexibility that without the backing of stability, the one friend that I just said can do that. Um, she's had to have hip replacement surgery because she was so flexible as well. She had a tendency to kind of, I'm going to use this word. It's probably not the best word, but brag about it, you know, because flexible people like to show off their flexibility but it was not a good idea for her to do that because before, by the time she turned, I think it was 45, she was already having a hip replacement surgery. And that's not a good thing. I mean, 45 and getting a hip replacement surgery. So many people in the yoga world um, who have, you know, worked on improving their flexibility, putting their foot behind their head, getting their forehead to their knees and forward folds, whatever it is. So many of these senior yoga people have had to have uh, hip replacement, spinal fusions in their back, shoulder replacements, knee replacements, you know, some sort of surgical intervention. And I'm constantly reminded of something my teacher Greg always says, uh, that if you only have flexibility, you will always have instability. And when you have instability, you always have the opportunity for injury. So we need to get uh, stability happening in those joints. And the other thing that we often forget too is that what gives us range of motion, this is a word you hear a lot of, like you need to improve your range of motion. Well, what is actually moving bones? Well, what moves bones is muscles. And in order for muscles to move bones, muscles need to shorten. And so what is the job of our muscles? Our job of our muscles is to shorten or contract. Uh, they contract in order to move bones and also to stabilize joints. And when muscles don't do that job uh, because of stress or trauma and overuse, overuse by forcing them to lengthen all the time. If muscles are not able to stabilize a joint properly, what is the result? The result is inflammation. And the inflammation is what gives you pain in that area. Well, and the inflammation then affects the nerves, which causes yes. it to seize. And because your body's trying to protect itself from the yes. pain that's now going through the nerve, and then yeah. the nerve gets inflamed and then then you're screwed. I'm sorry. Well, That's and it's a it's a vicious cycle. When you go into an inflammatory process, um, it really starts to disrupt more of the communication system between the brain and the muscles. So as a result of pain, that inflammation, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And sometimes the only solution for some people when they get into that really exacerbated state and they don't know what to do is to either take a lot of drugs or to and or to rest, you know, and you hear this a lot like, oh, you should go rest, don't move it, which you know, is not really the best thing to do. The best thing to do is to actually try to get those muscles back working again, um, which is not easy to do, especially if you're in pain. <laughs> but no, it, you got to no, get muscles that, working. Well, it's that it's that it's that sharp pain when you make that little move that keeps you from yeah. making your body set. Your mind says, "Oh, don't do that again." 
that hurt. And, and so you end up being very, very, it, it's hard. And, and, and why is it, is it because of our, our structure that our low back seems to be a focal point that everybody has pain at one time or another there? Well, that's a big um, discussion to have. Because I think there's a lot of causes for it. Um, one of the cause is the biggest cause, which is something that all three of us are doing right now, is sitting. So we're sitting for long periods of time, and that act of sitting starts to literally, not figuratively, literally shut down muscles that are supporting the trunk and spine properly. Um, you know, it shuts down our glutes, it shuts down our hip flexors, and even our back muscles start to shut down. And then, of course, our trunk flexors start to shut down. So they say after a friend of mine who is who is a physiotherapist told me one time that after 30 minutes of sitting, after 30 minutes of sitting, the glute muscles start to atrophy. Um, and I kind of find that kind of interesting. So it... <laughs> That's why like a few years ago, there was all of these articles about how sitting is killing us and, and it's not being really hyperbolic. It, it actually is. There's a lot of truth in that statement. And so the solution then is like every 25 minutes or so, get up, you know, go get a drink of water, um, you know, walk across the office, do something, you know, just for a minute or two and then come back and sit down again and so sitting is a big culprit. There's also a few other culprits. And that is, you know, in the yoga world and even in the fitness world for the longest time, we're being taught like you shouldn't have a curve in your lumbar spine. And the fact is, is that you should have a curve. You're, it's called a C curve, a lordotic curve. And then yeah. some people are like, well, you've got too much of a curve. Well, you know, some of the cultures around the world who have, big curves in their lower back, guess what? They don't have back problems. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. so we, we've spent a lot of time getting rid of that curve, AKA flattening our backs and that's not healthy. So there's a lot of like, you know, a lot of issues that have contributed to back problems. But one more quick point that I think gets overlooked a lot or understated is that back problems or back pain is the number one disability in the world. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. something that does not get talked about a lot. We talk a lot about disabilities, but back pain is considered by the World Health Organization as a disability. And it's the number one thing that affects so many people. Well, you know, Yogi, I've got, I've got an idea for you. Uh, yes. A way to get every woman on the planet to get up after 20 minutes of sitting and, and walking around and stuff and just say, if you want to avoid flabby butt, you're going to get up every 20 minutes or so, and every woman on this planet will get up because they the thing they don't want is flabby butt. Well, I would also say men too, because you know, you, yeah. you ever see that that Sex in the City episode when Samantha sleeps with the old guy and he gets up out of it out of bed and he's got no butt and it's just kind of like sagging there, and she runs out of that apartment so fast. So, you know, we've all got work to do to get our butts back. <laughs> exactly, and and Kayla contributes more. She says. Uh, our lower back holds negative energies and collective energy. I want to talk to you about that because always stay grounded and release the old. Yoga is a wonderful, wonderful for this. Uh, when we start talking about energy and the proper use of yoga, uh, I know that you are in, in depth at that as well. But there is a lot of energy involved with that, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, and it, that's why we practice yoga postures is to begin moving energy. Um you know, my background is really in Tantra yoga and Tantra is the science of energy management. How do we start to move energy in through our body and, and redirect that energy for lack of better words, or, um, and, or start to generate more prana. And so, you know, when we do like, for example, a forward fold where the effect of that, the energetic effect, the biomechanical effect is to feel calm and more grounded. 
you know, when we do backbending, we tend to feel more energized and enlivened afterwards. I mean, you can just do a simple, like, you know, experiment, just spread your arms and, and lift your chest and kind of like lean back a little bit. And you can all of a sudden start to feel like this energetic rush in the heart center and this enlivening in your body. So the, definitely there's things that start to shift and move in people's bodies as we go into the body and do these postures. And as the body starts to shift and the energy starts to move, um, this has a very strong effect as well in the mind and begins to shift the momentum of our thought patterns. We start to shift the way that we look at life and think about life, which is so cool. And that is cool. It's necessary. <laughs> it, it, it really is because if you take, if life is treating you badly, if everything is that you're a victim, you can't become who you really are. It no. it just it doesn't work that way. So so Kaitana, did you have a question? I know you, you asked. She asked really mm -hmm. good questions because she actually does research. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So. For those unfamiliar with the practice of ayama, um, what distinguishes from yoga tra traditional yoga practices, and how can individuals benefit from incorporating incorporating this approach into their wellness routine? Routine. How can so your question is how can people start to incorporate benefit, yoga? Benefit from it? Benefit from incorporating this approach into their wellness routine. Again. Benefit into bringing the muscle activation yeah. into mm -hmm. their routine. Well, I mean, I think that so many people are coming to yoga to, you know, because they've got aches and pains and they've got things going on and that by bringing more of the muscle activation practices into their life, you know, it's going to, I always say like, you, you know, my 80 year old self is thanking me right now for all that I'm doing. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's kind of like where my mind goes a lot. I got into yoga when I was 18 years old because I, I watched my grandparents moving their bodies. You know, my, my grandfather was kind of like this and <laughs> barely turn his neck and, you know, um, and, and I would always kind of work out at the community center and I saw a lot of older people, you know, kind of like literally hobbling or shuffling, you know, as they're walking because they had such limited range of motion. And so right away for me, the idea of mobility was connected to an idea of youthfulness, of vigor. If we look out into the world and we see people who are older that are moving, we go, oh, you're, you're acting very young. So there's definitely a correlation there. And if we want to keep that up, we need a body that's working properly. So many people say that age is the result of, of course, getting older. But from our perspective, from an Ayama perspective, that age is really, you know, in, in age, I'm talking about limitations and movement and that sort of thing. But that is really a symptom of the communication system having been deteriorated between the central nervous system or the brain and the muscles. So if we can start to incorporate more muscle activation practices daily, then we're going to have a stronger body in the, in the end. As a, and, and continuously, I feel honestly so much stronger today than I did you know, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years ago. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't have that fear. Like sometimes when I'm folding forward or to reach down onto the ground to grab something, I'm holding onto the counter or something for dear life uh, because I don't want to hurt my back. And so when you are constantly going through life, like, oh my God, I might hurt myself here. That starts to inhibit the way that we act in life, the way that we interact with life. And I remember when I broke my leg when I was 35, I was in the Himalayan mountains and oh, a boulder <laughs> came down the mountain and, and hit my femur bone. And I mean, it was quite an experience. Um, and when I came back into my life, 
I remember for literally a year after that, the idea of like every time I came to some stairs, you know, because I lived in New York City at that time and I was trying to navigate like all the stairs in the subway. And I remember grabbing the rail, the railing, uh, you know, to hold myself up. And, and even after my leg had healed and even after I got stronger, you know, there's still that memory of like, oh my God, what if I fall? What if I hurt myself? And there's, there's this distrust with the body. And what I have found, not just with myself, but what has shocked me in working with people is that they start to trust their body in a very profound way. Uh, when when we start to develop that proprioception, which is that that mind, not mind, sorry, that brain to muscle connection, we develop that proprioception and we do that daily, we start to trust ourselves, trust our body, that our body won't fail us. A lot of us, especially as we reach, you know, 40, 45, 50-ish, 55. Keep we, Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. 60, 65. Keep going. <laughs> but as we reach those ages, we have less trust of ourselves. We have less trust of the body. And that's a horrible feeling to have that we just can't trust that our body is going to hold us up. And what I have found in doing this work is that we begin to trust ourselves and we go, oh my God, I can do this. I am strong because that connection uh, starts to come and our muscular system starts working properly. I have a question to ask you because this is bothering me to a great degree. And maybe you can help me with it. <laughs> is it because I keep coming back to your age, Kevin? <laughs> no, it's, it's, see, here's the thing. I've never been this age before, at least uh -huh. that I can remember in this life. And so, <laughs> consequently, I see when I, I was a football player, I played football for four years. I was an all conference football player. I was a nose guard. I fell down a lot. I was a wrestler. Yeah. I fell down a lot. I was a baseball player. I fell that I know how to fall. Yeah. I can fall and not hurt myself. I've always been able to do that until now. <sighs> now it's like I lose my, if, if I fall, I lose my balance and I can't regain it. And I can't, I can't motivate. I can't move my body to, you know, like to, to, to like to tuck and roll or, or to do any. And so I fall flat on my face and I end up hurting myself because I don't have, is that just age or do I need to go do some yoga? Well, I d definitely would say that you need to do some muscle activation, you know, and again, there's this, there's, we're talking about trust. Like you're just not connected as much as to your body like you used to be those neuro and, and again this is not like making up something literally the neuro pathways have become compromised the communication system so if we got that communication system working better your muscles your body would start to respond it's probably been compromised and it generally is compromised due to stress uh trauma and overuse so as we um, apply more stress to our life, before you were talking about the effects of inflammation, the direct result of stress is inflammation, you know, and it, it, stress can be caused, as you know, as we all know, through, you know, um, like stress in a joint, like the muscles aren't supporting the joints of the body properly. Stress can also result from emotional stuff. You know, maybe you just had a disagreement with somebody and you're like stressed out about it. That can also create, you know, inflammation in the body. Maybe you ate something you shouldn't and there's a stress response in the body. So stress can, the, the effects of stress are detrimental. From our perspective, from a Yama perspective, what we want to do is doing these muscle activation. So I was asked earlier, like the benefits of this is that we actually begin to increase our stress tolerance level so that we're no longer being affected, detrimentally affected by the stress of life and that you can do your tuck and rolls, Kevin. <laughs> I, 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 I want to get back to that because the last time <laughs> I fell, 
I had to call 911 and she said, hello, oh. 911. And I said, I know you've probably never heard. I actually said this. I know you've probably never heard this before, but I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> She was probably wondering, is this a prank or something? <laughs> <Not exactly. laughs> and she laughed. And, but I, before we go, before we wrap this up, I've got to ask you because you are an expert. And I would like you to, ex I would like you to explain. I know. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. But I, I'd like you to explain to us. You're an expert on Tantra. And yes. there are so many different things that are said about tantra and what it is what it isn't is it a sex thing is it you know you know what i mean can you can you help our audience understand what it is how it can be beneficial and um what what and go on did you know <laughs> I so just, i want to just state for the record that tantra has absolutely nothing to do with sex and if you come across somebody that starts equating tantra with sex i would say don't just turn around and walk away run like sprint the opposite direction or you might be uh pulled into some sort of sex club uh with them so <laughs> well, I, there, there you go you you ruined my my theme for the show which is going to be get some tantra sex and that would drive my listeners and i would make lots of money <laughs> but, but i want tantra, the truth to be out there Tantra is, I, 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 it means a few things. There's a few meanings behind Tantra. Um, one of them is, you know, the literal word Tantra means to become limitless, that we are moving towards huh? becoming limitless. So what is the part of us that's becoming limitless? Mm -hmm. It's our mind. So, so much of Tantric culture in the, in the history of Tantra and the Tantric teachings is about helping us to get out of the cage, the self-imprisonment that we live in in life, which is our own mind, and opening us up to the universe of limitless possibilities. So the practices of Tantra, there's tons of practices. Uh, one of my teachers, Pandaji Rajmani Tiganai, says that it would take you over a thousand lifetimes, like a thousand lifetimes. I mean, just think about that for a moment to do all of the practices in the tantric uh, world. So there's a lot of different teachings in, in tantra. And most of your listeners have done some form of tantra, you know, participated in, in different practices. You know, we there's astrology, there's numerology, there's... Um, uh, just regular yoga practice, yoga asana. Before I was talking about doing backbends, well, backbends help to energize us too. And in that space of becoming energized and open, what are we really doing? We're getting our mind out of ourself. We're getting ourself out of ourself and moving into that universe that is limitless and open. Um, so that's Tantra in a nutshell. But one other little thing I wanted to say about Tantra is that if we look in history and, and, you know, Tantra also transcends religion. So you actually see in a lot of different spiritual teachings, a lot of the different great religions out there. And if you kind of peel back the layers of them, what you actually begin to see is that they're teaching you rituals in how to connect with your infinite nature. Um, you know, and, and, and so especially like, I'm going to just kind of revert back to Hindu culture for a moment. One of the reasons why I love going to India so much is because you see the tantric culture, you see the tantric tradition alive and well, so much of what is in Southeast Asian culture, especially in India is this constant, uh, reconnection to our infinite nature, to God, if you want to call it God, to the higher spirit, if you want to call it that, whatever you want to call it, we're constantly going back and reconnecting to that. And as we connect to spirit, as we connect to our infinite nature, we're connecting to that universe of limitless possibilities that, that, that guides us on the path of living our life purpose. Oh, I agree. And that is our life purpose is... I don't care how you get there. It's important. And Kaitani, you had another question, I thought, I think. 
Uh, uh, yes. Oh, uh, before before I ask before you ask yeah. that question, I just wanted to say that a thousand lifetimes is how many lifetimes it would take me to be able to t pronounce your teacher's name. Can you give us that, <laughs> that his name again? <laughs> pundit, pundit, uh, um, Rajmani Tigana. I, I always say PRT for short, but he is the spiritual leader of the Himalayan Institute, which is in Honesdale. Pennsylvania. And he took over it after uh, Swami Rama of, of the Himalayas um, left his body and he became the spiritual teacher for that place. Um, and he's also my teacher as well. Very cool. So, Kaitana, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, in your extensive experience studying both ancient yogic teachings and modern scientific practices, what specific tool have you found most effective in enhancing the overall human condition, encompassing physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being? <laughs> so I'm going to reinterpret your question and, and say you're asking me what practice is the one that stands out the most. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're asking me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what would be like the number one practice? Mm -hmm. um, that's a hard question. I, you know... There's so many, but for me, the place to start and the place to end is always within the breath. And, you know, I, before I was just talking about in different tantric practices, there's a lot of different tantric practices. I think for me, some of the most profound ones, and there's a few different profound ones, uh, but the most profound has always been the breath. And I'm always kind of reminded of Genesis, you know, when God um, created man, what did he do? He breathed life into man. He animated man through the breath. And so that tells us a lot of things. But uh, fundamentally, if we want to connect to spirit, you know, we want to connect to the divine. It's right there in the breath. All we got to do is just breathe and connect to our breath. And that connects us to our higher self immediately um, if we do it properly. So I'm constantly teaching and having my students come back to breathing. And, and, and when I say breathing, it's not just, okay, take a breath or two, <laughs> you know, it's not, that's not breathing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very, you know, systematic and it's very specific and, it's it's diaphragmatic and it's intentional and it's 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 purposeful so the, it, the breath is our single most um our or the biggest connection that we have to the divine and if i had to give people just one practice like there's just one bullet and you got to do this practice it would be to breathe and and to take five minutes, again, set your timer <laughs> and do five minutes every morning and it will change the trajectory of your life. I promise you. I want to just say that when I got hit in the Himalayan mountains by that boulder, you know, it was a very profound moment for me. But I was one of the things I have a lot of gratitude for was that my teacher taught me how to breathe properly. I was on that mountain. I had no painkillers, no help, you know, at that moment. Um, and there was other things going on, but you can only imagine the amount of pain I was in. What kept me sane and what kept me connected and grounded uh, was the breath and what got me through it. And it was just a constant inhale, two, three, four exhale two three four inhale and that you know calmness that i was able to cultivate in my breath was what got me through that moment as well as many other moments in my life and and helped me to stay connected with the higher part of myself if you want to use that word I do. I think that's a good word to use. Um, and and by the way, uh, uh, Rachel says, um, I think that's right. Ra Raquel. Rachel. 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 <laughs> okay. Like I said, English is my second language. Uh, thanks for this guy's good talk. Yoga has helped me over the years, uh, too. So, um, 
And I want to thank you, Yogi, for being here. Uh, you you really are a fascinating man to talk to. Um, going to now, what possessed you to climb a hill, Himalayan mountain? <laughs> So that's a good I question. See, <laughs> I, see, I see Mount Rainier over here, which is 14,500 feet all the time. Big old mountain. I have no desire to go climb that thing. <laughs> so just for the record, I, I don't want to confuse people and say I was like climbing. It was hiking up <laughs> um, where the boulder did hit me. It was on this glacier, which was very steep and uh uh, anyways, but that's another story. What possessed me to was I, you know, being a yoga person, being a yogi, Yogi Aaron, I just felt like I wanted to understand where my tradition came from. You know, where did the yoga tradition come from? And what was it about the Himalayan mountains that inspired, um, inspired these great teachers before me? uh, to come and, and connect to, you know, the, the infinite, what was it about this place that created the foundation for these spiritual teachings to awaken? And so that was part one. And part two was that as I went back and I went back several times, I've been to the Himalayas about six times now. And every time I go back, I'm just wowed. And there's this feeling of, of coming home, and once in a while, you're very lucky to stumble across a real teacher um, on the path and uh, and be able to spend time with them is one of the greatest gifts I've ever had. Guy Thailand, do you have another question or can I ask one? <laughs> uh, I have one more. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you think our diets um complement for our decaying and pain and you know sickness and inflammation i that's a loaded question <laughs> yeah yeah it is. i you know i don't i think eating alive food is really important um as opposed to canned food or processed foods i think i think first and foremost and when we eat dead food so Ayurveda is the sister science to yoga. Um, when I say sister science, you know, there's the yoga tradition, then there's Ayurveda, and they're both pointed towards the same goal. And so a lot of people in the yoga world will actually dip their toes in both worlds and use both to get them to the goal. But one of the founding principles of Ayurveda is that you eat a live food and, um, and you eat whole foods and, and that sort of thing. And so we know that when we don't eat well, uh, that we, that in and of itself creates inflammation, you know, so there's, there is a correlation to that, but I'm going to put a big, but on this, what we also know, and this comes back to what I was saying earlier about stress, stress creates inflammation. And we see so many people today, and I come across this all the time because I own a yoga retreat center, and I see so many people come with their food and dietary issues. And I have a lot to say about that topic, um, a lot. But <laughs> one of the things that I will say for sure is that I believe, and because I, I, I say believe, I'm pretty certain this is true, but I say belief because I don't think that there's been enough studies. There's not enough empirical evidence to show this, but a lot of people don't have their, they don't have the food issues that they think that they have. What the problem is, is that they're stressed out. And when we're stressed, what biomechanically happens is that blood is pulled from our digestion and, and sent to our extremities. We also produce more adrenaline, which has a very negative effect on our digestion. Think about if you have a fight with somebody. Now, maybe before that fight or argument, a heated argument, uh, maybe you're going to break up with somebody. I've had this happen a few times in my life. <laughs> and so before that discussion, before that argument, I, I remember feeling ravenous, like, oh my God, I want to eat. And then you have that disagreement and then there's that hunger is no longer 
there because your whole digestive system is messed up. Now you think about how often people are, you know, addicted to stress, you know, they go on their phone and they start doom scrolling. They start turning on, you know, the news station and, and start like doom watching, you know? And so we're constantly getting stressed out and, and it, it's not going down. It's getting worse and worse. And so I really believe that so much of these food issues uh, that people have is, is contributed to either a not eating properly, meaning like eating a live food um, and eating whole foods and B even more than that. I really believe that stress is killing us um, in our digestion. And so the solution then is to start creating pockets in your life that are without stress start to have those moments where we don't turn on the phone or turn on, uh, you know, the news station <laughs> and <Yeah. do> scroll <laughs> and you will feel better in your digestion, um, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, good answer. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. By the way, we are talking with Yogi Aaron and you can contact him by going to oddly enough, Yogi Aaron with two A's by the way, uh, dot com and um, he's got a, a program or he's got a something for our listeners that don't go there yet and if they go there don't tomorrow or the next day um, and so this is uh, this is, is December 14th so if you listen to this on the 15th and 16th it'll be there and that is to go to uh, um, the yogi club backslash PTR and he's got a special prize for you. Uh, just, we'll we'll let him talk about that later, and and but or you just just go there. But but more importantly, if you feel like um, I, I have a good friend, she's got low back problems, so she's been told stretch, stretch all the time, do this and stretch, and and it's not getting any better. And so I'm gonna have her listen to this, have her go to your site because you can help her maybe get to stabilize that area because right now it isn't stable and the less stability it has the more pain and the more inflammation you get the more it affects the nerves and all of that and it, it can become a chronic condition and so we want to avoid that and if I, have i misspoken anything there no i think you hit it all on on the head and and again you know, with your friend and like with so many people that are in chronic pain, you know, yoga teachers, uh, and this is part of my mission is to give yoga teachers more information because so many yoga teachers are making claims, ridiculous claims about the body. And, you know, like when I was dealing with my back pain, um, you know, in my early 20s and then 30s and then 40s, you know, I go to yoga teachers and they would say constantly, we need to open your hips. You need to stretch those tight hamstrings. You need to, you know, do all of these things, which was all horse pucky. Um, we needed to, what we needed to do was get certain muscles starting to work properly. And that's one of the problems is that we're addressing the tightness, the muscle tightness by trying to stretch, but that's not really addressing the problem. The problem is the instability. And when the body feels unstable, it starts to tighten up. It seizes up, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so what we need to do is address the instability problems. We don't, you know, stretching the muscle is not only just a band-aid to the problem, but it's actually going to exacerbate it and make it worse. So please have your friend reach out to me. If she's got any questions, I'll, I'll point her in the right direction if she wants to start treading the path of living her best pain-free life. I am, I'm going to give this to her and tell her, you go, do it. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do have a question for you. And this is coming all the way back from, do you remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz? Oh, yes. Was she a good witch or a bad witch? How do you tell the difference between a good yogi and a bad yogi? Or are there any bad yogis? I think that that's a hard, that's a tricky question. Um, I think I, also political in nature, and you could get into trouble. So I don't want you. To yes, well, yes and no. I, I'm very when it comes to talking about yoga teachers. I mean, 
You know, the the biggest thing that you need to do when I say you, I mean your listeners and, and people in general is empower yourself with knowledge. Um, when people start doing the classes that I'm teaching and then they go listen to a yoga teacher talk, they're like, oh my God, this yoga teacher, I know more than this yoga teacher does. And so many yoga teachers don't know what they're talking about and they just make up stuff. And, and by the way, I'm specifically referring right now to biomechanics. I'm, re I'm specifically referring to the body and they just, they make up stuff. You go to a yoga teacher and, and you have say yoga teacher, I've got shoulder pain. We need to open up your shoulder girdle. That doesn't make biomechanical sense. It does not make sense. Yoga teachers love to say things like we need to open the hips. If you open your hips, you're going to end up with dislocated hips. And I don't think that's going to help you to lift, mm -hmm. live and manifest your life purpose. So we need to bring common sense into this. And, and I would just advise your listeners, like, go and find a teacher. But if you start hearing them say a lot of things that doesn't make sense, trust that you're hearing what you're hearing. And then you have to decide if you want to hang out with that teacher or not in the future. So use common sense. And I think that one of the problems in the yoga world is that we've thrown common sense out and replaced it with a lot of um, gobbledygook. And, uh, and we've just bought it lock, stock, and barrel. So we need to bring back common sense and say, does that really mean, does that really make sense? And is that really going to help me? And um, if you, the answer is no, then run the opposite direction. <laughs> is, is that kind of like, do you remember that story or that thing they did in grade school where you line up 10 kids and you tell the first kid the story and yeah. then he turns to the next kid. And by the time it gets to the other end, the story is completely different. That's the same thing with how yogi, yoga can be taught is the guy that knows what he's talking about is at this end and your teacher's way over here at the other end and and it, it's gotten convoluted all the way through well i think i think some of it is i mean yes and yes and no i think that a lot of what is out there is just the blind leading the blind and um and and it's just been perpetuated and then of course you get into the whole thing of like you know, marketing, like there's hot yoga classes or there's yin yoga classes and all of these things start to become fashionable and, um, you know, just like Lululemon. And so we start to want, you know, all of us human beings want to be the best version of ourselves. And so when we see somebody who we think is the best version of themselves, we gravitate towards that person. But yoga demands that we do our own work. And we have to get to work on ourselves and 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 do the work ourselves in our in our own way as much as possible. You know, I just heard of one uh, the other day that a guy was telling me about on on the air on the show, and it was hot naked yoga. And yes. I said, isn't I said, isn't that kind of a how can you concentrate on your breathing when you're <laughs> When you've got naked, naked people all around you, and he said, "Oh, trust me, it's not that way at all. It's all." Uh, and I, you know, I, I know a lot of men, and I can tell you what: if we's naked enough with a bunch of women, we ain't concentrating on our breathing. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yes. You're concentrating on other things. <laughs> well, we're visual. Men are visual beings, and and when we're being stimulated you know, visually. I'm curious. <laughs> 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 I think everyone will be looking. <laughs> she said the other. She said, "Yeah, I'd check them out. You bet." So anyway, but is that a th is that a thing or is that just a fad? No, I mean, I think well, yes and no. I th it can be turned into a fad. Uh, when I lived in New York City, uh, one of the things that I did was I started a naked yoga group for men. And I did it for a lot of reasons. Um, I went to a boys boarding school when I was uh, in my younger years, teenage years, obviously. And, you know, there is a feeling that was cultivated within me um, of just brotherhood. And, you know, one of my favorite memories is 
of when we would go on like these outdoor trips and we used to do like three week canoe trips up oh, wow. into Northern Canada and the great lakes, et cetera, et cetera. And as we would be paddling through these different waterways, one, of, by the way, these were like big trips. One of them was like 900 kilometers. I think that's 600 miles or something. Yeah, that's so they were, it was very intense and, you know, we would just go skinny dipping and, um, and uh, often, and there was just like no shame. And it was just like, you know, we were who we were. And I kind of wanted to bring that feeling of community and camaraderie into um, the, specifically for men in New York City. So I started creating this class and I thought, you know, I mean, I had a real sincere interest in starting this in the hopes of creating community, I never, ever, ever would have guessed how profound that community would become uh, in New York. I thought, you know, I'd be lucky to keep this class running for six months. You know, it, it's going to be a short term thing and then I'll move on. It ended up going on for over 10 years. And um, and then what ended up happening was is a lot of other um communities literally around the world, all the way from Australia to London, started doing this as well. And it's kind of really cool because I think that when we strip away the layers of who we think we are, um, we get down to a more authentic sense of ourself. And what I often found, and now I never taught co-ed naked yoga, so I can't speak to what it would be like to have you know, men and women in the same room. For me, it was always a passion project to create this for men. But what I can tell you is that the level of focus and intention um, was something that I've never experienced in any other uh, kind of surrounding ever since then. I think that men uh, teaching those classes and having that experience um really showed me the power of what happens when we bring men together uh, in that kind of environment and practice yoga in a very sincere and earnest way. Well, it's, it's a lot easier to, to do it if it's, if it's just like with men or just with women. Yes. Um, yeah. Rather than, you know, cause it's, a, but <laughs> see, I can see a, a co-ed yoga <laughs> class, class being 11 men and one woman, you kind of think, you know, that kind of thing. So. No, but, well, there but was I, a class, there was a, there was a class in New York where this woman, um, I think her name was Isis. I can't re quite recall, but she decided to start a naked yoga class. And so I actually went to it just to support her and, and just to see what it was about and, and stuff like that. And, and it was, it was exactly that there was 24 men and one woman, <laughs> her teaching her, the class. Her. I was <laughs> like, you go girl. <laughs> See, there's, there's a reason why every bar in the country has a ladies night because yes. and they let the ladies in for free because the guys are going to show up in hopes yeah. of finding a lady. It's the ladies you got to get there with, you know, free stuff. <laughs> so anyway that's my cynical attitude about that so, um i but yogi i gotta tell you it's been great fun kaitan any other questions any thoughts that you might have i wanted to uh know uh if um you're writing a new book besides the other one that you have well, I have a couple of books out already. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. I have, well, I have one that's called, um, you asked me about food earlier, and um, I wrote a, a cookbook called Eat to Feel Happy and Healthy, Rainforest Recipes That Bring You Joy. Uh, that's one of my last books. And then my other book um, that I've written is Autobiography of a Naked Yogi. And I'm my looking at it right now. Yeah. My big book <laughs> that I have is uh, Stop Stretching a New Yogic Approach to Master Your Body and Live Pain Free. And there I have all my secret sauce um, on how Ooh. to live your best pain free life. And if you're an audio person, you have a podcast too, do you not? Yes, I have a podcast. It's it's not a podcast that's a weekly thing. It's just an eight-part series. It's called Stop I'm Stretching, obviously. And yeah. 
<laughs> and it's 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 a series that really dives into this topic, um, kind of fleshes out everything that we've been just talking about, and approaches. It talks about like you know what we need to work on in the yoga world uh, and how we can make things better. So, and and most importantly, how you can live your best pain free life. So the the book and the podcast are great complements to each other. Well, I'm glad you're doing all that you're doing because living Thank pain you. free. I mean, I know people. My my sisters had 15 surgeries, um, <gasps> and they, 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 they she she would not look at doing some alternative medicine things, and and so she's had neck surgery three times. She's had back surgery. Her back is a mess. Her, she's had both hips replaced, both knees replaced. She's almost bionic at this point, but she's in wow. constant. She's in constant pain, and she's yeah. scared of falling down. And it's, it's it's she's seventy, so you're getting older and and, and stuff. Yeah. So, but I that's why I in, encourage people to find you and uh, yogiaaron dot com is a, is the place to find you. So that it would be nice to not have that until you're ninety. Yes. Um, or you know, 120. <laughs> 120 would be good. But uh, so before we go, I want you to take a moment and tell our audience anything that you would like them to know. Well, I, you just said, you know, like I, I wish that your sister, it's your sister, correct? Correct. Um, that is my much pain. older sister much older sister, 70, but you know, had she done some things when she was 35 and had the foresight to go, my 70 year old self is going to thank me right now. And that's the kind of perspective that I have, you know, before in about an hour before I got on the show with you, I got, I rolled out my mat and got on the floor and, and did some stuff for about 15, 20 minutes because I knew that my future self was going to thank me. <laughs> and it will. And, and I think like sometimes, you know, we have to hold that in, in, in our minds, you know, as, as to help us stay purpose centered, like how is my future is my th do things that your future self is going to thank you now for. Mm -hmm. All right. And I agree with that 200%. Kaitan, anything else you'd like to add? I want to say thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to have you here again. Thanks for asking such great questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're and she, welcome. <laughs> and he is going to be on again, remind me, in January. January 17th. That's yeah. it. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, on KKNW 1150 AM and... Yogi, if you'll wait right there, I just want to thank you again. Go to yogiaaron.com, get all the information you need, and it's worth your time. It, yes. Being pain-free, and trust me, being pain-free as you get older, because there, I didn't believe it. when Somebody told me this a long time ago. I didn't believe that there was a difference between 40 and 50 or 50 <laughs> and 60. Or 60 and 70. There is a friggin' big difference between 40 and 50, 50 and 60, and 60 and 70, and then 70 and 80. If you, <laughs> if you want to feel good when you're 80, you have to work when you're 40. That's yeah, kind of the way it goes. So thank you, uh, everybody, for being here and uh, and for you guys. And, and, and by the way, your retreat's in Costa Rica, so you could go Ooh. down there and have a great vacation and see Thank Yogi you Aaron down there. What do you think? Absolutely. I have a pain-free yoga retreat coming up So if you in, at the end of February. So if any of your listeners want to become pain-free in seven days, come and join me in Costa Rica. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you again. I'm glad we got that in. We need to make sure that we, we can get it because it's important for people to be pain-free. Yeah. Um, yes. thank you, Kaitana, for co-hosting with me, and thank you, Yogi Aaron. This was this was really was a lot of fun. We got to do this again. Um, and and people are really interested in what you do. So thank you, thank you. 
Hey, thanks for enjoying this episode all the way to the end. Please give us a like and subscribe to this channel. This has been a production of PositiveTalkRadio.net. Please visit our website, oddly named PositiveTalkRadio.net, for more details about us and our mission, which is to provide great positive programming designed to inspire us all. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I'm proud of these shows, and I truly hope that you'll like them and share them with friends and family. So on behalf of our entire team, remember, be kind to one another.